My name is David Hogan. I'm the academic lead for the Brenda Stratford Center on Aging within the O'Brien Institute in the um, Cummings School of Medicine at the University of Calgary. I want to welcome all of you on behalf of the Brenda Stratford Center on Aging. To give you a little bit of introduction to ourselves, we are a University of Calgary academic center that lives under the umbrella of the O'Brien Institute of Public Health in the Cummings School of Medicine. Uh, that said, we are multidisciplinary and uh, we are designed to represent the faculties of nursing, social work, kinesiology, medicine, and the other faculties within our university. Our overarching aim is to enhance older adults' lives by promoting interdisciplinary research and education, engaging the wider community in nights like this, and including older adults themselves in these activities and finally informing public policy. I should mention that we are live streaming this event, so uh, particularly in the question and answer period, you might want to keep that in mind um, because it will be a permanent record of whatever you happen to say. <laughs> Hopefully not. Um, now, as we move into this evening's presentation, I just want to highlight a few things and try to set the stage for our discussion about resilience. Now, I'm going to show you a slide. And this shows uh, survival curves for Albertans. It shows the expectations for people uh, born in these given years to live um, a full span of years. In 1956, if you were born that year, you would anticipate that 9.7% of the Alberta population would reach 90. Now, in 2016, that proportion has increased to 32.6%, more than tripled. So one out of three of um, individuals born in 2016, our children, our grandchildren, can expect to live to be 90. So we're going to be here a long time and we want to be uh, here for a good time as well. So I want to talk a bit about the implications and we want to clearly promote high quality of life as we grow older. We like to promote resilience. And I should mention that tonight and tomorrow, we're not equating resilience to a very narrow definition of what would be more appropriately termed physiologic resili resiliency. And that's the ability of an organism, could be a human, could be a research animal, uh, to cope with a challenge, a single challenge, uh, and return to their normal baseline function. That's quite restrictive. Uh, we are faced with a variety of stressors in our lives. And when we look at resiliency, we look at it at the level of the person, but also in their family, their network, in their community. And after this past weekend, as communities, we all have to develop a great deal of re resiliency to deal with the trials and tribulations that we're all facing. Um, so we're looking at a broader definition. We're looking at different levels, we're looking at different stressors, and we're talking about the ability to cope with a challenge, not necessarily rebound back to what things were like exactly before, because it might be a somewhat different way of dealing with the current status that we would be facing. Now, I would like to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Janine Wiles from the University of Auckland. Fortunately, she spent time in Canada, in Queens and McGill, so she knows our weather. And she graciously told me today that it was probably snowing in Auckland today. <laughs> I don't think it snowed there in 100 years, probably. <laughs> and particularly at the start of their spring. Dr. Wiles is an associate professor in population health at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. She is a geographer and gerontologist and uses a critical positive aging framework. Her research encompasses three disciplinary areas, social and health geographies, critical social gerontologies, and community health, and links together three themes, care, place, and aging. She has published numerous articles, book chapters, and reports on topics including older people's resilience, well-being and identity, and a strengths-based approach uh, to aging. Um, homes and communities as sites uh, or landscapes of care, and contextualized experience of family or lay caregivers at home and in communities in light of social and political change. She also has written about healthcare access for marginalized groups. Join me in welcoming Dr. Wells for a presentation titled Resilience in Older Age, What Can We Learn from Older People? Doctor. Thank you. 
Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, hello to everybody and welcome. Um, thank you very much for having me. Thank you for the warm welcome in spite of the cold weather. And thank you to each of you for coming out. I, I also, I'd like to thank you for acknowledging the um, first peoples of this place and I'd also like to acknowledge um, the traditional territories of the Blackfoot and the Stone, Stony Nakoda and the Tsutsina and the Métis people of this area. And my welcome when I said tēnā koutou is the Indigenous New Zealand, the Māori way, Te Reo Māori way of saying greetings to all of you um, and to your people. So, um, yeah, I'm here to talk about um, what we can learn from older people when we um, talk about resilience in older age. So let me just uh, introduce you a little bit to myself so I can explain a bit about where I'm coming from and you um, have a sense of that. As, as Dr Hogan said, I'm a geographer and a gerontologist and I've done a lot of work around ageing in place and attachment to place. Um, and I work currently in a school of population health where we think a lot about social determinants of health and health inequities and equities and so on. A lot of my work is as a qualitative researcher and I'm really interested in how people talk and how we can engage with that. So I do a lot of work around um, narratives and positioning of people. And as uh, Dr Hogan said, I have um, worked in New Zealand, but I've also worked in Canada. So I did spend some time in Ontario, and then in Scotland, and then in Quebec. And I've been back home in New Zealand, and this is a photo of my two little boys in a, in a favourite camping spot of ours. Looks like Calgary. <laughs> Today, yeah. <laughs> this is what I'm looking forward to when I go home. It's spring at home and all the blossoms are out, so yeah. So this is a little bit about some of my work and some of the work I'll be talking about tonight. Um, the, in purple is work that's completed and in the blue is work that I'm, we're currently engaging with. And some of this is I'll, I'll talk about um, particularly around resilient ageing in place. So I was very fortunate to be part of, uh, to lead a project where we um, spent a lot of time engaging in two communities, two local communities in New Zealand. Um, both of which, uh, in terms of statistics, uh, ranked as being having low socioeconomic status on all our indicators of that, but both of which are really warm communities with a huge sense of pride and really interesting in terms of the older people who live there. So one was the community I grew up in and the other was like, the community I was living in at the time. And they were both um, very diverse communities in terms of their older population. And we were very fortunate to be able to work with older people and talk with them. What, how did they think about resilience? And so that work had started off, we were wondering, it had started when I was in um, Montreal working with a team there, and we were wondering what makes a home an ideal place to grow older in? And as we talked with older people, we realised the question probably wasn't quite right. It should be what makes, what's an ideal place in which to grow older? And what does resilience look like? So a lot of that work that I'll talk about we were working in focus groups and interviews, often led by older people themselves and working with them to define resilience. And so that's a lot of what I'll talk about tonight. I'll also talk about some of these other studies. The LILAC study in particular is a big multidisciplinary um, study with people in advanced age. So we invited in a, in a region of New Zealand, everybody born in 1925 and everybody who was Māori born between 1920 and 1930 because there's differential life expectancy for Māori. Um, and that's been um, over several years, we did several waves of data collection, but there were some qualitative parts to that too. And more recently, I've been working in a project associated with that, talking with the people, um, caregivers nominated by some of those people at advanced age, that if they passed away during the time of the study, we could talk with their caregiver about what that experience was like. So there's some really amazing data from that. Um, there's a social isolation and loneliness and connectedness study that we're currently working on, looking at the, the, those experiences for diverse, culturally diverse people. And at the moment, I'm very fortunate to be part of two studies, one on Māori experiences of end of life and dying, and one on Pacific people's end of life experiences. In a new study that we're just working on about inclusive streets, um, looking at older people and people living with disabilities in the context of some of these active streets and getting people walking, which is very interesting. Just a bit about New Zealand. Um, so we're relatively isolated. You can see us right down there in the bottom next to Australia. Uh, my colleague 
wanted me to have this map upside down. I used to always have that map of the world upside down because we think of ourselves as the top of the world. But um, as you can see, we're quite isolated, so it takes a while to get anywhere really from New Zealand. Um, more importantly, it's quite uh, New Zealand itself is quite a sparsely populated country. So we're relatively long from um, the north, which is relatively warm, to the south, which is much colder and more similar to, uh, well, not quite as cold as here, but more similar to your climate. Um, it's quite, quite different. Most of the population is up in the top uh, there in Auckland, which is our main city, and um, over a quarter of our population live there. Māori are the indigenous population of New Zealand, um, and currently about 15% of the population. We're relatively recently colonised, about 200 years ago. And the Treaty of Waitangi was the treaty between many of the Māori iwi and the um, British Crown at the time. And we consider that our constitutional founding document. So that's based on principles of partnership, participation and protection, that Māori have sovereignty essentially. It's been very contested though and um, a, lot of, a lot of issues around that. There's also a lot of cultural diversity in New Zealand, so um, we have particularly a large or well, relatively large Pacific migrant population and a la fairly large uh, migrant Asian population, some of whom have been there for many, many generations, many of whom are relatively new. Um, and there's a lot of inequities between those groups. So particularly for Māori and Pacific, life expectancy is much lower than for, for non-Māori, non-Pacific, and that's important to understand for a lot of what I will say. We also have an MMP electoral process, so if you're following the news, we're currently governmentless because we've just had an election and we're trying to our govern the two part, nobody could um, form a government, so there's a process going on at the moment of coalition building, so we're waiting for that. Um, that's currently our time. And um, I gave Anne a bit of a scare a week ago um, because I, we had the one supply line to Auckland bringing aviation fuel was broken by a digger, of all things. And uh, so flights were all stopped out of the country. We couldn't go, everything was um, shut down. So it is quite an isolated um, place in many ways. It was a huge cost for us as a country. So thinking about um, resilience, I think this is a really interesting pr approach. And it really steers, it's a way of steering between two quite um, well-known perspectives. One is sort of looking at ageing, at, at ways of combating ageing as decline and frailty and diseases associated with ageing, which is quite oriented towards a pathological approach to old age. And on the other hand, um, the, the approach to successful ageing, which was made popular by Rowe and Kahn. And while that's a really interesting approach and an alternative to ageing as a pathology, it's quite a narrowly defined and elitist kind of definition in terms of um, being an absence or minimal decline in cognitive, social and physical function. So I think resilience is a really interesting way to steer between those two concepts or ageing well. It's a strengths-based perspective and I think what for me is quite attractive about it is that it's a way of exploring the experience of vulnerability and acknowledging that people live with vulnerability rather than avoiding vulnerability, saying we can live with that and be well. And so it's achievable for everyone and it's an inclusive approach. And before I go too much further, it would be quite good just for each of you to stop and think, do you think of yourself as a resilient individual? Are you resilient? Yes? No? Yeah, what do you think? It's worth keeping that in mind as I keep talking. So first I'll talk a little bit about how academics have defined it, but what I really want to talk about is how the people, the older people we talked with defined it. So uh, a very common definition is this idea of flourishing despite adversity. And a lot of that definition focuses on some of the risks or the problems or the adversities and the protective factors that allow people to flourish in spite of diversity. The, um, the ability to bounce back and recover physical and psych psychological health in the face of adversity. And you can see that adversity being a really important um, characteristic here, but also this ability, the ability to bounce back or to recover, coming back or adapt to new, new things. So and in that third definition, you see that word adapt, so the ability to adapt positively to adversity and other challenging life um, circumstances. So really, uh, these are, this is, this, um, whilst there's a massive amount of literature on resilience, this, is, this kind of sums up a lot of, a lot in, a, in a very brief way. As um, 
that these are these original definitions a lot of this interest has started with psychologists so some of the early work in resiliency started with child psychologists particularly and as psychologists they tend to be interested in the characteristics of individuals over time social scientists other social scientists have become more interested in the concept and was and they've tended to bring more of a focus on um, more on context on the role of the environment so here's um, Jill Windle and colleagues arguing that we need to pay more attention to family and community resources. That's a major weakness of existing attempts to measure, to create a valid measure of resilience. How do we account for environment? And um, uh, Gisela Van Kessel, this is a really lovely paper, um, re reviewing a lot of this concept of resilience, talking about environmental factors beyond the control of older people within society and care delivery systems play a big part in terms of resilience. And so we see more of this um, focus on, on context, on structural factors, on systems, on other people around an individual and how that matters. This works quite nicely in terms of uh, models like the population mental health promotion model. And this is a model that assume, emphasizes the relationship between individuals and their environment as an ongoing process this is a really nice paradigm. So it's the idea that we do live with ups and downs. Things aren't always ways we do live with um, issues that come up. Um, but all of us, there's an assumption behind this model that all of us are driven by a desire to be well. We do want to be well and um, what, we can survive ups and downs. Life has ups and downs, we can survive them. But we need supportive environments around us to do so. And so they, this, this kind of more social um, context model looks like this. So um, going back to Gisela Van Kessel, she identifies some of the factors that she finds in a systematic review of both qualitative work and quantitative work. And I think this is where qualitative work or more open-ended questions really come into their own. Because our results, the things we find are always only as good as the questions that we ask. And if we come in already with assumptions that resilience is all about personal characteristics, that's what we're going to find out. So if we come in with more open-ended questions, we tend to hear different, more things. So she identifies some of these internal factors as we would expect, so things like self-care. Increasingly we see attention to spirituality, for example, um, an orientation to the future or a sense of curiosity or purpose in life, caring for others, which is a very increasingly coming through in the literature, acceptance and openness to one's vulnerability. But she also identifies more external factors, so things like social support, positive relationships, um, social connectedness, social policies that are positive, um, societal responses and ways of representing and responding to old age and availability of resources. And so increasingly um, these factors are, are really important and um, I think that difference between asking more open-ended questions is highlighted here. So in our study when we sat down and talked with older people and what I'll call the resilience and ageing place study we spent a lot of time um, discussing with, with the, our participants. We had over 120 participants, many from Māori and Pacific and Asian backgrounds. Remember, both li all living in two communities that are relatively under-resourced in, in many obvious ways. Um, and we talked with them. What does resilience mean? And it was a lot of really interesting discussions and conversations about that. And what we came up with is that one can live with significant adversity, but consider oneself to be well. I can live with bereavement, I can live with disability, I can live with illnesses, but I can still consider myself to be well and to be a healthy person. That living with was really important, rather than in spite of. So that was the first thing that was different from what academics say. So people talk to us um, that it did include, being resilient does include a sense of struggle over time, and they felt themselves to be resilient because of the difficult things they'd lived with. Many of these people had lived with poverty, for example, had lived with stigma, and they felt that they were resilient and they had skills because of those things, because of the ups and downs that they'd been through. They talked about their ability to negotiate and to renegotiate adaptation in the face of those um, new challenges and adaptations, and their sense of pride in their ability to do so came through really strongly. So this really challenges that any, any kind of sense that there's a dichotomy that one is resilient or not. Instead, what people were talking about is we see ourselves as resilient, but that's something that happens over time. And I might go through ups and downs. There might be times when I don't feel particularly resilient, but I still identify as a resilient individual. So let me show you some quotes. 
This is um, a person in one of the communities in an interview, uh, in a focus group, sorry, talking about um, her attitude. And so often people would start by talking about attitude. So you've got two choices. You can go through life being miserable or happy. You might as well be happy. And then she tells us, this has never been a bad situation. I couldn't turn around yet. It might take a bit of time, though. Okay, and that emphasis on the time that it might take um, to do it. So this, it's not that I'm healthy and la, 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 everything's fine. I do go through ups and downs, but it, it may take me a bit of time to turn situations around. Here's another um, individual. This person uh, was in a mobility scooter and had quite significant um, illnesses that she was contending with, particularly around vision and memory um, at the time. But she really, she talked about this statement, so we would start to show people um, statements that had come from other material. So this idea that you can live with disability and be healthy, I like this statement. Um, and she then goes on to say, you've got to reach a place where you can accept that. My doctor reminds me, you've still got the basic disabilities and illness. You still have those things. You've just reached a place where you've got it all in perspective. And then she says, but two years ago, I couldn't have done that got to reach a place where you can accept that, but I couldn't have done that two years ago. So both of those examples are people talking about there are ups and downs, but it's that process of negotiating them and getting, and getting involved. And this really resonates with other work. So this is work by, um, by Bianca uh, Jansen. This was a study in the Netherlands done about the same time as ours, and the, the similarities in their findings are remarkable. I hadn't seen this work until after we'd um, published ours, but very, very, very similar findings coming out of that study. So that personal ways of coping can be enabled or not enabled by empowering relationships with, um, with health providers, with formal ca caregivers, and informal relationships with families where those are seen as empowering. And this is a message that comes through very strongly in all of our work, that it's, that it's relationships that are meaningful and high quality that matter. And by empowering social policy. And they also highlight the process nature of resilience. So it's not something, um, they, they, something that takes time. And like us, they emphasise the way that it's not easy to deal with accepting help, especially in an environment where we're kind of highlighting independence as being the kind of ideal and that we should somehow be all independent. So um, that it's not easy to deal with help, accepting help from others or using medical devices. And I think that mantra of independence versus dependence, as if these are somehow opposite sides of a coin, is really problematic in this, in this field of resilience. And we need to think about that a lot more carefully. We're all interdependent all the time. It's just that for some of us, it's easier to hide that and to make it look as if we're independent. This also resonates quite strongly with, uh, with Masuko Nakashima and Edward Kander's work on positive dying and resilience. And this was work done in Kansas with 16 older people who were at the end of life dying. Um, and they talked about a whole set of core resiliency factors. So again, the empowering relationships with others, spiritual beliefs come out here strongly, um, confronting mortality, having a stable environment, but also this idea of a tension between surrender and resistance, knowing when to accept things and when to fight and struggle, and that balance, the difficulty of that balance of that. And they talk about the importance of environmental resources, a stable environment to be cared for, having, having a pleasant environment in which you're living as well. So we can see uh, in our work, when we first listen to people, initially what we do here is this really strong emphasis on the personal characteristics and the internal resources that the psychologist emphasised. So having a positive attitude, for example, our people talked about counting their blessings, having a sense of gratitude, being thankful, having a sense of purpose and keeping busy, and that could be a whole range of things from, from work, voluntary or paid work, through to interests and things that they had. Um, they talked about not waiting for God, not sitting around waiting for things to happen, but being out there and being active. And to some extent that's um, that's this idea of keeping busy, keeping active was really important. It's partly internalising some of these active ageing messages, but also a really important um, strategy that people use. And it could be a whole range of things they talked about to do that. But when we listen very carefully, we also hear people talking about the external resources and how important those are. So how important social support from friends and family is. That was really interesting because it looked very different for different cultural groups. So for our Pacific our older people, for example, having support from friends and family was how they were independent. That was really important to them so that they didn't have to ask for help from formal services. 
Whereas for our New Zealand European uh, older people, it was the opposite. So they wanted to be able to have services so that they're not relying on their family members for everything, that they could have a more personal relationship with their family members. So it's really important that we remember this. What autonomy or what independence looks like for different cultural groups is quite different. It looks quite different and feels quite different. They talked a lot about neighbours and community, and in both of these communities, the diversity of neighbours was really important. That sort of bridging and uh, social capital was really important to them. And the importance of services and agencies, obviously, too. So I'll come back to this slide and I start to build up a picture of the things that they talked about. Okay, so there's personal characteristics, but also external characteristics. And so this is a quote from one of the women in the study talking about the neighbours next door, the boys next door who come over, they're good to me, they bring me fish and they fill up the fish and they grow vegetables and they bring me vegetables. But what's important is what she says at the end, I've got fruit trees on my place, I give them back lemons and grapes and oranges and stuff, it's so nice. So the sense of reciprocity in the, in the to and fro-ness of that relationship is what is so lovely about that relationship to here. And this is in a community that's seen by outsiders as being deeply stigmatised and very problematic and full of, so this sense of lovely um, connectedness was fantastic. And uh, this is people talking about the, the place itself, so it's the convenience of this place for me, it's well service, there's buses and trains and doctors and nurses and shopping, you know, we've got everything really, haven't we? And this same group went on to talk about how they would go and monitor the trains and buses and make sure that the drivers were being courteous to people getting on and off, and so they were quite actively ensuring that those services were there too. And this is um, a couple. Uh, this is a couple talking um, in a in a in an interview. And she talks about, well, if you get a funny knee, and you have to, you still, you still, and you have to walk with crutches. You still can. There's still life beyond that funny knee, isn't there? That's that sense of living with an illness, but still being resilient. Um, and um, and then she talks about being able to take to accept help is a really important idea. So there's life beyond that funny knee. But the important thing is to accept help, like Meals on Wheels if you need it, and to accept it graciously. And this was something that came up over and over again, being able to accept help, rather than feel it's a charity. And if you accept it, and if you can, you give it back, even if you only smile, okay, that sense of reciprocity. And her partner comes in and says, I think you've got to be aware too of all the services and things that are around that can help you, and she rejoins with, and be prepared to take them. So that sense, having an awareness, but also being prepared to take them. And they talk quite a lot about this, what it was like to um, actually take, use services. So um, I think the, the thing that we hear quite clearly is that resilience incorporates an acceptance of one's vulnerability. And I think it's quite important that we start challenging vulnerability as being a negative term or something that is a problem. Um, that maybe we can think about vulnerability as something that each of us has. It's a sense of receptiveness or stillness or grace, being open to things. And the other thing that comes through quite clearly is um, the importance of the ability to reciprocate and to recognise what's coming and to have what you are giving back be recognised. So this reciprocation is really important. One thing that came through very clearly also, um, this is a um, discussion in a Māori focus, a focus group that was made up of all Māori. And so they talk about our kaumātua. Kaumātua is an elder role amongst the Māori culture. And they talk about how our kaumātua find another direction in their lives. And if they're happily doing that, they get a lot of personal satisfaction out of that. So what this person is referring to is that kaumātua play a very, very important role in Māori society. So the whole cultural strength and enrichment of Māori society in general is pin, underpinned by the role of, of older people. So they will stand on the marae, do the call. So this picture is of Faya Seal, who is a kaumātua in our, one of our research groups in our advisory, and she's doing the kaikaranga here. She's calling people on to the marae, which is a really important role in Māori culture. So older people in Māori culture actually become very busy. I've um, noted Mason Jury, so it's Pre Professor Sir Mason Jury's work here, because he talks about um, in Māori culture, once you become a kaumata or an older, elder, you actually become more busy than any other stage of your life, perhaps. And in fact, they're, really, they're travelling most of the time. They're going to tangi or funerals. They're playing a role in um, groups. Um, so I, in two of the research groups I'm part of, we have a Māori advisory group, and they would play a big role. They'd come with us to, to many of our meetings, our hui. They'd play a role in, in a lot of our um, 
uh, research meetings, for example. And so this group agrees with the speaker and um, talks about whatever tragedy or whatever um, they might trip over in the meantime, the environment, and, that, that, and certainly helps them get back on their feet. It helps you get over anything untoward that happens in your life, as opposed to sitting around at home and moping. So you get to have, you have quite a busy um, role in that situation. So with old age comes a whole new set of expectations and a set of mana and demands on you that, um, that in many ways, this group is talking about this being quite protective of health and well-being for older Māori. It's also demanding, I think we should point that out too. Um, and I think that's really important here, um, that this point that for me this raises, is that we can think of resilience, we often think of it as an individual characteristic. I think that's right. But we should also be thinking of it as a collective characteristic. It's something that, it could, that we could think about for a whole group at the same time as well. So, um, and carrying on in that vein, this was, for me was one of the most exciting parts of the study of resilience in older people was just how much we heard about the contributions that older people make. And so we talked about those, um, we often talk about older people in volunteer work, and we certainly heard a lot of that, people working in, um, in the um, organised kind of volunteering roles like Meals on Wheels or volunteering for local causes. But we also heard these other three ways of contributions that people made. So one was in an advocacy role, um, whether that was representing their local community or raising awareness and giving people information, so sitting on committees with the social housing group, for example. Or, um, or representing, uh, helping people access to benefits and their care entitlements. We saw nurturing roles, so lots of work um, nurturing connections amongst the community, nurturing relationships between different groups, often quite diverse groups in the community, and there's some beautiful examples of that, reaching out to other, other groups. Um, or working in community gardens, for example, or um, there was one group that went around every Every day they would go around the local community painting out all the graffiti that had come overnight, for example. And that was their way of nurturing the community and creating a sense of pride amongst the community. And we saw a lot of activism. So people involved in environmental activism on local issues, for example. People involved in protests, writing letters actively to politicians, getting politicians along to look at housing and do something about the local quality of local housing, for example. So um, this was a really interesting part of the study. We also saw this, so this is in another study, this is the longitudinal study of advanced age that I talked about. And in one of the waves of data collection, at the end of the questionnaire, people were asked, um, and these people at this stage were 90, at least 85, the non-Māori non group were, 80, were 90, and they were asked, what are the highlights of this stage of life for you? And what's really striking about the replies is that the first, the main kind of highlight that comes back is around activities and interests, so the hobbies and the things people like to do. But one of the next, within that, one of the biggest things that was talked about is the support. And it was the support that they give to others, not the support they receive, the support they give to others. And that was the highlight of being in this stage of life for them. They did talk about the support that they received and their gratitude for that. And they talked about reciprocity of, of support. But this is one of the most interesting things about that. And then they talked about relationships and health kind of comes out there too. So this is an example, this is very typical of what people said. So being older, we've been around a long time. I've brought up families, I've lost a child and a husband. So I understand what death and sadness are about. And this is where I can help. I call it my granny talks. Some people are lonely and that's where I come in. Um, I let them get rid of all their worries on me. I love people, so in my mind I will never get old. And this is a good example of what I've talked about so far. So that sense of living with ups and downs, this is hardship that she's talked about. But um, this really strong sense uh, from this woman that um, it's, it's because of those that she's visiting. It's because of those things she's able to give help. And it's also because of her age. So in some senses, it was people, there was a really strong sense of continuity of self. These were people who had always done things for other people and helped others. But there was also the sense that advanced age itself was an enabler. It enabled them to be more helpful to others, and so bringing that in. In uh, a study we're doing on social connectedness and isolation and loneliness, we've also talked with people and the, some of the things that they talk about are the quality of relationships with family and that those are meaningful, not just functional. So where they're simply functional, those are very 
disempowering to people. They do they create a sense of isolation and loneliness. It was really important to those to to this to this group. They tell us how important it is to have those celebratory meals with family, for example. It's important those happen as well as the functional help. Um, they talk about local interactions in their neighbourhoods, being part of community groups, and um, and their role of services and a sense of company and how important that is to them around isolation. They also talk about the sense of imagined community fostered by the media, and I think this is a really important aspect of resilience, is the ways that older people are represented in the media. If they can be very disempowering, it's often a very ageist way that we talk about old age. But it can also be quite empowering. So these people talk about that sense of imagined community. We're all in these tough times together, aren't we? We hear about these things and we're all in this together, um, and that can be helpful. So back to uh, summary, so we see those personal characteristics and the external resources. I've talked about incorporating a sense of vulnerability and a sense of meaning and that ability to contribute and participate and reciprocate and how important that is. That's really critical to people. So we see all of these things, these quite personal um, characteristics that people talk about in terms of what characterises resilience, so being positive and grateful, for example, um, being involved, keeping busy. Um, reflective storytelling and review. And I don't want to diminish the importance of those personal characteristics. I think that's really important. But what I do want to highlight is that each of these things involves engagement at broader scales. Each of those things, to be able to achieve them, you need a supportive environment around you. So um, to be able to stay connected, you need living environments that are conduits to connectedness. You need to be physically active. It's very helpful to have uh, walkable spaces, for example, and green spaces that enable you to do that. So that's really important that we think about that. And Paula Gardner, the Canadian Paula Gardner's work on third places, I think is really valuable here. So she talks about um, third places or natural neighbourhood networks as being really critical places of ageing for older people. They're third places in the sense that many older people are not travelling out to work, which would be the second place, I guess. And so your local neighbourhood becomes really important and she talks about exploring the public life of older people in social space, ageing in place, and neighbourhoods are the material places that occurs, those interactions, often quite fleeting, sometimes transitional, that happen in a coffee shop, for example, or as you go down the road, and how important those are. We see that very much so amongst caregivers also, that um, for, for them those relationships become really important. And she also talks about how important it is that we create a... Um, um, an environment that, that enables that. So these are some quotes from her study um, about um, the value of things like being down at the sports park where you can always have a coffee and someone will talk to you. But also that in winter, I'm careful not to go out when it's icy or snowed, I just stayed in. Okay, so about if, if the sidewalks are clean, I can go out, I can go do my shopping. And she talks about the value of this for healthy ageing and, and um, well-being in an advanced age. To, that we facilitate those non-kin relationships, which are often ignored when we ask questions or discuss. People don't tend to talk about those kind of relationships. She learned about this by doing go-along, um, accompanying friendly visiting and go-along interviews and, and unpacks those kind of often quite fleeting, quite informal relationships we don't talk about much. Uh, and, um, and in our lilac study, we have done some work there. This is the Rupu Kaitiaki uh, Nga Tikanga Māori. This is the um, Komato group who have guided this whole study um, throughout. And when we looked at attachment to place amongst that group and work we've just published this year, we actually found we could measure a relationship between health outcomes and a sense of attachment to place or that connectedness to the place in which you leave live, but that, that worked differently for Māori and for non-Māori. So for older Māori, um, the relative importance of nature and the outdoors to them and their sense of connectedness to, to their neighbourhood and their community, and for older non-Māori or New Zealand European, it was the extent to which they liked their home and liked their neighbourhood and to, to which they felt connected to their neighbourhood and community. Those were positively associated with various health outcomes, functional status, physical health, mental health. We could measure the ways in which they were, which was really exciting. Uh, in another study, a qualitative study we did, um, where we had conversations with people over the period of a year, we saw that um, attachment to place, how complex it is. So it's a balance of socio-emotional 
and physical practical aspects of a place like the location and convenience of their home or how proud they feel of their community, their involvement in neighbourhood activities and proximity to family. That all characterise uh, their resilience. And this really resonates with um, Powell Lawton's, the environmental gerontologist, the, the father of this kind of thinking, model of person and environment fit, which some of you will be familiar with. So this is the idea that um, as one's personal competence or abilities decrease, the press or the stress of the environment becomes greater. Okay, so if we can with, reduce the press or the, or the stress that environment creates, for example, design barriers or traffic, barriers to uh, access to public transport, for example, making it easier to find your way in a public building like a hospital, for example, all of those things. If we can make those less pressing or less difficult, um, it's, it um, matters less your personal capabilities. And so this is an example. As your personal capabilities go down, the press of the environment increases. And so we have an onus, it's our onus as a society, to make sure we have less environmental press. So that's the idea of person environment fit. Going back to what um, we hear from older people about resilience, one of the things that came through quite clearly is that resilience operates in very different domains. So we can think one might have quite a strong sense of physical resilience, for example, but less resilience in terms of one's economic finances, for example. Or you might have um, very limited mobility resilience, but quite high social resilience. And we started to see these different domains. There's a whole range of domains we could think about. I, I don't think there's a limitation to this. So um, we could think about uh, emotional resilience, mental health, a historic um, temporal resilience, spiritual resilience, all of these things. And so I think what's really interesting about these is um, how they work together. So we could see quite clearly these things. And the other thing that happens is we can think about these in different scales, which I'll go on to talk about. So we can think about individual resilience, we could think about resilience at the middle level or the meso level, so the level of the household or the immediate community, and we could think of it at the broadest society level as well. But all of those things interact. So what's going on at the broadest society level impacts on what's happening at an individual level too. And I think there's some really interesting questions to raise about these, so there's lots to be explored here. So um, does, does um, the importance of, if you've got lots of resilience in one domain, does that mitigate having less in another? Or does it influence it? Does it kind of spill over into it? If you're having trouble vice, the other way, if you're having trouble in one domain, will that come, somehow drag down the resilience in another domain? Do they sort of have some kind of multiplier effect? Is, it, is there some d domains that are more important to others? I think there's lots of um, really interesting questions to apply here. But this idea that resilience can operate in different areas of our life or different domains, I think, is quite important. So thinking about uh, the lilacs um, group, for example, looking just at the Māori cohort, remember those people who were aged between 90, 80 and 90 years at the start of the study. We had 417 of those people. And one of the things um, in terms of cultural resilience, for example, we could measure an association, a quite strong association between better health, measured as um, self-reported health through the SF36, which is a validated tool for measuring that, and their personal functional status, and the extent to which they were engaged in cultural practice, which we measured as the number of visits to a marae uh, recently, the frequency of marae attendance, which is where they would be uh, playing those quite strong roles. We could also measure worse health associated with colonisation, which we measured as having ever experienced discrimination, and also whether they reported that colonisation affected their life, so a self-report. So we could see that kind of measurement in that domain of their life, both as a protective effect and as an adversity. And that's a really interesting um, part of that study. And that resonates with other work, and um, for example, in um, America with Native American elders and resilience, where um, this study with Donna Granbois talking about um, the culturally relevant use of storytelling, for example, and how uh, resilience is meshed with that kind of wholeness or oneness of creation, and that um, elders gain their strength and resilience from their, each other and from their families and sense of family. We also see that uh, in a study on, uh, I love, really like this study, it's a really interesting study, on the role of time and history. So this is um, uh, Colette Brown and her colleagues 
working on Native, Ameri Native Hawaiian elders. And they talk about the importance of um, different ways of relating to time in the past. And that for Native Hawaiian elders, the past is really important. So we need to think about this. It's probably quite hard to see, but in that, um, in that uh, paper, in the article, they have this lovely diagram. They, they've laid out a series of events over the life course of older Hawaiians and how these might affect those people who would be born at different stages and what that would mean for them in terms of how they would relate to health services, for example. How they would, whether they might feel quite disempowered by those, whether their experiences as a child were very demoralising and very alienating, or whether they were a young child at a time when services were beginning to be more culturally um, safe and culturally appropriate. And that that will have an impact right through to the present in terms of how they engage with and think about services. I think this is a really interesting um, way of thinking about culture and history as a domain of resilience. So they emphasise that uh, there's different pathways, different processes to resilience. We need to be really careful to think about that. So we've also said different, uh, resilience operates at different scales. And in that earlier diagram I showed you, individual, middle, um, um, uh, societal. And I think these are some of the ways we can think of these as all nested. So the individual in the context of the family, very much a socio-ecological model of thinking about resilience that, that operates at all those different scales. So we can think of that from the personal individual level at the micro level right through to the collective whether that's um, our friends Jansen, the, the study in the Netherlands, talk about this as individual interaction and environmental. Um, we could look at this. So here's some examples. We could think about mobility, for example. It could be your personal mobility, whether you have, how, how functionally mobile you are. That's going to interact with the level of mobility in your family or your household, how much how accessible cars are to you, for example, and the level of accessibility in terms of the local public transport system that you have. And in the communities we were working in, there was very poor public transport. It was a huge issue for people in terms of their mobility. Um, when there's just no buses, nothing comes along, there's, too, there's nothing there. You can think about that at the financial level, so the personal finances that an individual has, what's going on in their family or their immediate meso level network and what's happening at the societal level. So in a society where you have good delivery of publicly funded health services, for example, and care services, that's going to mitigate to some extent what's happening at the household and the personal level. And we could also think about this in terms of the symbolic ways we think about ageing too. So your personal ideas and experiences about ageing, how you feel about growing older, this is your family and neighbourhood values about ageing. Consider living in a Māori community where old age is revered and valued, and societal norms and representations of ageing, often many of which are very negative and not very helpful in how those things all interact. So this is an example um, for older um, spousal dementia caregivers from Warren Dunnellan and colleagues, um, and they're looking at the factors that facilitate or support people in um, in terms of resilience, how they see resilience. This is a really um, interesting paper. And so they talk about that access to assets and resources isn't always enough to facilitate resilience. So sometimes it's about, uh, they might be there, the services might be there, but it's being able to actually engage with them and accept them. And they talk about these, some of these factors that seem to facilitate resilience. So relationships with family that people prefer to avoid feelings of dependency. Um, social support from, fam from friends, best when people are recognised as experts rather than being relegated to a kind of dependency role. Um, recognising the importance of health and social care, so um, really knowing the importance of, of using respite care, for example, and, and recharging one's batteries. And they talk about the way that services that encourage independence and giving back might be preferred. And I think what's really interesting about this is the idea that if we're going to tw think about resilience, we would start from a strengths-based perspective. We start with where people are strong and we build on that. And that's why I think it's important we talk about domains of resilience and scales of resilience. That to, in order to deal, to encourage resilience, we, rather than coming in and talking about what's wrong with people, we start with what, where the, the areas that they're strong. Here are the domains or the areas where you excel and how do we build on those and enhance those. In our study uh, work with end of life care and caregivers, um, we were really interested in the extent to which um, some of this work around public health palliative care models that Alan Kelly here 
and Kai have talked about, this idea of a social model of, of palliative care, um, that palliative care should be happening in the community rather than being left to professionals. What was really interesting about carers of people in advanced age dying is we found very little evidence of any kind of community support. So those narratives are really powerful and strong and quite, um, they have a lot of resonance with people, but for people dying in advanced age, which is going to be the, by far the majority of deaths in our society, will be people in advanced age. It's the success of our societies that, we, that people are living to much older ages, but our palliative care systems are still geared towards younger people and towards an oncology model. And so what we found, very limited evidence of community support and very limited evidence of new social networks happening. So we really need to start thinking quite hard about this and fast in terms of supporting families as people in advanced age die, um, pass away die. We can think about this in terms of the uh, age-friendly cities model, age-friendly communities, and fundamentally those, those, um, those, those eight domains that they talk about are an ecological approach. And what's going to work about those is creating connections between the older person and the environments that they live in. So some of Verena Menick and Nora um, Keating's work thinking around how we think about that as an ecological model. It's really great we have this model of age-friendly cities, but it's actually really hard to get at some of those less tangible things. And how do we move um, across to those and, and really think about those? How do we move beyond sort of the physical resources and the services and start to think about some of those less um, measurable, less tangible things that go with that. And that really comes to thinking around dementia-friendly communities and some really interesting work about that. So um, this is some work from uh, Lynn Mitchell and, and Elizabeth Burton in the UK talking about um, some of the um, six kind of fundamental principles of dementia-friendly communities. And what they talk about is that um, the neighbourhood scale is what's going to be most important. People with, living with dementia do go out, they often go out alone, and so we need to have um, communities that have these principles that are familiar, that are distinctive, legible, um, and um, safe and comfortable. And it's really important we think carefully about these. The image that I've got there is that some of the things they talk about are having self-explaining streets with street furniture or things that are distinctive, like plantings on them, for example, that people can recognise where they're going. Big, long avenues are really not helpful, whereas smaller curving spaces are helpful. Good signage matters. But um, some of the quote, quotes from the people in that study, when I'm out, the world belongs to me. I feel, I rejoice. So that's, it's really critical that we think about the neighbourhood scale. And this is a lovely example of, of thinking about dementia-friendly communities because the way we're going to do that is, has to be focused starting small in lots of little uh, things. So this is a study uh, in the United Kingdom um, that a colleague, Christine Milligan, has been involved in evaluating. She's doing lots of great work around dementia-friendly communities. So this was called A Life More Ordinary, Creating Dementia-Friendly sp Spaces, and it was around a theatre where they created a space that um, had a whole lot of things that were inclusive of people with dementia and their caregivers. And this is one of the issues that they raise, is we can't just have services for people with dementia or for caregivers, we need to have things people can do together because one of the struggles is that suddenly you're apart. So this was that people could do it together, um, the signage, things like the lighting, they kept the lighting on in the theatre, they had, it was okay for people to wander around and sing and talk, they had in fact stopped halfway through to have a bit of a sing and a talk. Um, the, the menus in the cafe had clear writing and pictures of what was available, for example, all the signage for everything was well designed and the positive um, accepting atmosphere that they created and, and the huge success of this kind of initiative. Um, but it's thinking about those broader things, the less tangible things, the being inclusive of couples that was important. Um, and this operates here, so this is the study just come out um, from your Canadian study around seniors in transition where they looked in, um, at uh, transitions to residential care over two years and the finding there is that almost a third, between 22 and 30 per cent of um, admissions to residential care could have been avoided had there been better community-based support. Okay, that's that environment and the role of the environment. So they talk about the need to expand home care services for much better coordination between agencies and informal caregivers within home care services and between acute and continuing care services and that all of those things could reduce 
ARC uh, age residential care stays. And we found much the same thing in our study. So that fragmentation of services is particularly an issue for people in advanced age when we've interviewed people from the LILAC study and um, their primary healthcare teams, the GPs and the nurses that look after them, they talk about the fragmentation of care and fragmentation of communication between secondary services, hospital services and community-based services and the primary care team. Um, when we looked at the end-of-life care for people in advanced stage, the same thing happened, that the fragmentation of services was a huge problem for caregivers and had a, a significant impact on the well-being of the older people at the end of life themselves. It caused them pain and problems. So that fragmentation of services at the community level we really need to address. So just to wrap up, I want to think about, well, what does this mean for four groups? What does this mean for older people and their families to think about resilience like this? I think first it means we have to have lots, much earlier conversations about people's goals and their expectations and their wishes, that we need to be talking about those things a lot earlier um, than once we kind of into a crisis situation. I think recognising resilience as an ongoing process is really important, so that people will often have periods of stability, but they might be preceded by quite a lot of um, uncertainty and instability and emotional distress and being able to understand that. I think um, recognising and um, being respectful and supportive of the difficulty of accepting help in a social environment where we talk about dependence and independence as if they were um, positive and negative sides of a coin, to be um, accepting to people about what it's like to accept help and to help people understand that accepting help can be enabling. So not accepting help can sometimes lead you into worse, um, worse off situations. Um, to recognise the importance of reciprocity. So rather than always representing older people as passive recipients and dependents of care, I think really lots more work looking at the contributions that people make and how valuable they are needs to be done. And I think it's really important to recognise older people as experts in identifying those areas of need and coming up with solutions and how we do that rather than um, always being researchers doing that and how we ensure that they're implemented and monitored properly. For supportive services, I think we need to think really careful, carefully about the expertise of older people. So thinking about a resilience approach, we would be starting with the areas that people are strong and building in those. How do we build on the areas that are resilient? Um, Recognising people's roles as, as contributors and as carers, uh, building on those positive domains, and where we can, supporting independent decision making, although that takes a lot longer and it's a lot harder and it often starts with very small steps. It's helping people negotiate meaningful access to services and resources. So thinking about some of those cultural differences in terms of how a resource or a service will be perceived and understood. Um, helping people think about ways that they can um, manage their sense of self uh, following adversity and still hold on to that rather than kind of being roped into a passive role. Uh, I think it's looking at the importance of a professional attitude towards older people and that influence of that on care and how critical that is. It's absolutely, utterly critical. So not ignoring people's um, feelings about accepting care and understanding um, yeah, the, the value that a, that a professional plays um, in building those relationships and the social aspects of the, of the interactions as well as the clinical and professional aspects. And we saw that really clearly in, in our qualitative study um, the therapeutic relationship between people in advanced age and their primary care positions was, uh, physicians was absolutely critical to them, far more so than the, whatever clinical interactions took place for them. Um, and, and thinking about encouraging inclusion and connectedness, so I think um, programs that can enhance connectedness, um, ideally if we can find ways that older people themselves can initiate and be in control of those things rather than us as, or professionals always doing that. I'm getting um, feedback here. In terms of um, for, res for research to understand resilience, um, think, thinking about older people's perspectives on what resilience means more, I think that's really, it's been a really fruitful area for us. There's lots more to unpack there in terms of um, what resilience looks like. It also to think about what other stakeholders think, like the professionals that work with older people. To think about what's perceived as adversity, for example, because that may be... Um, um, different than what we might expect. I think we need to ask a lot more questions about contexts, 
So the environments, the physical environments, the homes and neighbourhoods, as well as the symbolic environments, so the ways that media works, for example, in creating this. We need better understanding of resilience as a process. I think that's really hard to unpack, that kind of ups and downs and living with that, and how do we do that? So maybe things like longitudinal narrative studies would be helpful there. Um, and better understanding of how those scales and the different domains of, inter of um, resilience interact, whether they um, multiply effect on each other, whether they mitigate each other to some extent, how they work and interact with each other. I think thinking about how we can effectively assess and monitor the efforts to recognise the complexity of, a, of resilience. As soon as we start moving into this much more holistic way of thinking about resilience, it gets really hard to think about how we can assess it. So things, community-based research partnerships with older people, working again in partnership with older people, I think, is probably a way to go there. Um, and thinking about how supporters can mobilise resilience amongst older people, how, how others around older people can support that too. And for policy, I think um, this kind of approach, a more socio-ecological approach to resilience is really difficult. A more narrow approach really lets policymakers off the hook because it's the responsibilities on individuals to be resilient and to build themselves. If we start to think about environments, right away policymakers are on the hook back again. So how do we um, deal with that? Those contextual explanations are far more challenging to deal with. So our age-friendly policy is a fantastic start, but we've got to move way past those, less, um, those more tangible starts and think about um, things like the social values around older people, for example, and ways of communicating. We need to invest and optimise living environments and systems to support wellbeing. So things like um, supportive or enabling niches for older people, those neighbourhood level dementia friendly communities, for example, enabling those third spaces would be really important. And making sure that um, people themselves can control and remove environmental barriers. We need lots better coordination between um, services as well. So to sum up, I think these are some of the things that we learn about resilience from older people. They talk about, um, they do talk about personal characteristics and internal resources. But they also talk about when we listened really carefully and when we opened up the conversations, they talked a lot about those external resources and the relationship between those. I think what for um, probably one of the first things that was really valuable for us was this idea of living with adversity, living with things that are difficult. So that resilience is about being with those rather than in spite of them. Resilience is about living with the ups and downs and adapting to those and how important that is. And the other thing that for me that's really important is the sense of living with vulnerability and the courage to, to talk about being vulnerable, the courage it takes for each of us to talk about that and that we need help and that we, we are interdependent all the time. And so that's really an important part of it. Another thing is the sense of meaning around um, one's identity as we grow older, but also that resilience can be both and should be thought of as both individual and collective. It's something that happens to groups, communities, communities of place as well as communities of culture. And I think that idea about um, the ability to contribute and have those contributions recognised, the ability to participate in the decisions about um, older people and, and reci reciprocate, that those are all really important too. We've talked about domains, so the different areas of one's life in which one can be resilient as well, and, and to what extent, how do those work together, what do they look like? But also that thinking about those, we can look at areas in which a person might be quite resilient, areas of their life or a domain in their life, and build on that as, we, as we're looking to support and increase resilience. And likewise with scales, so thinking about both personal and more middle level and more societal levels that we can intervene to think about resilience. And lastly, to emphasise that there's different pathways to resilience. Okay, and there we, we really need to be aware of it. It's not a one-size-fits-all. Um, it'd be nice if I could come up with a simple explanation like that. But looking at their cultural diversity, looking at the gender diversity, which I haven't talked about much, um, all these different ways, the different places that people live in, and ways of thinking about or pathways to resilience. And I'll wrap up there. I think you can see I've been really privileged to be able to listen to so many um, older people talk about what resilience means to them. I'm very really lucky to have had that experience and listen carefully to that. There's um, a lot of material there. So I'd like to just acknowledge and thank all of the people who've participated in the studies.
that I've talked about and all the funders who've enabled us to do that as well. Um, as well as the, um, the two particular groups, the um, Rupi Kaitiaki from the Linux study and the Te Aro research group for the end of life work that we're doing. And thank you, and thank you to all of you. Awesome. Yeah, I think so. And yeah, I, um, we've, I mean, we've just kind of highlighted these, and I think there's lots more work to be done and to understand how they work. Because it could be that, that having strength in one domain kind of spills over into another. If you have um, those examples I gave of having cultural strength, for example, um, we can see that that spills over into health, for example, um, both in positive and negative ways. So. Perhaps, perhaps it is the case that having strength in one area influences others, and that's certainly my argument that we build on areas that are strong. Um, yeah, we don't know. I don't, I don't think we know. Yeah. Hi, um, thank you very much um, for your excellent uh, uh, talk tonight and the commentary about uh, all the interpersonal relationships and the things that we should be looking for as we get older in our communities and our society. One of the things that I don't quite see here, and I think it has to be, uh, has to do a lot with your uh, method of speaking to people and to interacting with people, communicating in different ways. Our modern society today is the interaction with communications devices, with the internet, with cell phones, with the various ways of um, getting to, to meet with people but not being there with people necessarily. This is infiltrating a lot of our different um, modes of communication and interacting, even with our own families. As we get older, I'm, we're finding a lot of people who are older who are actually getting quite involved in that kind of communication, and they have all the devices to get to know all the internet, internet and the uh, computers. Can you comment, please, on how technology is going to influence the kinds of results that you find? Yeah, that's a great question. And we certainly saw that in some of our studies. The, um, the one I, study I was talking about, about social attachment, um, lots of the people in that were, whilst their social spaces were decreasing, the people around them, they actually were, we, we talk about how their social spaces are also increasing at the same time because they're Skyping the grandchild in London or attending the wedding via Skype of their niece. You know, they, they are participating in things all the time. For that, and there's two things that I'd say about that. One is that a lot of those technologies, the interface is becoming easier and easier to use, and that will increase. But at the same time, that that's it's still very uneven who can use it. So, um, in the resilient aging studies, actually several of the focus groups we had, they talked about exactly that issue and being able to get online. And they were, you know, um, a lot of those focus groups, they talked about ideas for let's for things that they could create and, and one that came up perhaps most often was computer groups or groups to teach people how to use those devices but still for some people that's still very difficult so I think in some ways it opens up possibilities for lots of people but at the same time it also increases some of the inequities um, in terms of those who can't do, do those and won't do those yeah so so yes and no I think yeah I think it's really exciting for lots of people it will become a lot easier but yeah what, what do you think? Yeah. I think the um, technology aspects have got to be taken into account in your studies. Um, the ability of some people to go ahead and uh, uh, get quite involved uh, um, finding out information. People, people are, 
yeah. curious about their lives as they get older. They yeah. want to know more about what uh, the world is, uh, is about. They are finding the methods by which to find that out on the internet and through yeah. other communications. It's, uh, it's evolving to the point where um, an older person is very um, um, capable of having a good discussion about world factors in, in these days. So uh, the fact that they know more about what's happening in the world and what could happen to them or what they could do about it should be um, considered as part of your evaluation yeah, sure. and how they communicate. Sure, sure. I agree. Yeah, sure. We can think about that. And I have a um, colleague, Juliana Mansfeld, who's done some really great work in exactly that field, looking at the role of um, communications technology. Uh, one thing I was going to ask you, and, and one of the um, challenges, or I, I guess characteristic of Calgary, for, for example, is that it's, um, it's a city where people move to. It's, it's not a, um, a, an old, multi-generation type city. I mean, I mean, there are clearly neighborhoods where that is the case. But um, many people moved here. And from the standpoint of developing a community and networks, um, any advice you would give to a city like Calgary, where, you know, you know I, I mentioned 1956, Calgary then was, what, 100 to 200,000 people. Now we're over a million. And, and clearly that, 800,000 weren't here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's where I think um, creating initiatives uh, in the social isolation and loneliness pro project, we, in Auckland is a very similar city. Auckland is a um, very much a migrant city. And, um, lot, most people have moved there. Right? Um, a lot of them talked about that they wished there were opportunities to get together and meet people, especially the migrant groups in that study, actually. Um, in ways that they could create friendship groups or, or, or get online and do that too. But creating initiatives where people can get uh, some resources to do that is really helpful. So one um, example in one of our studies um, was a group of ch uh, Chinese migrants. And so in, in Auckland, it's quite a common thing. People will come to live with their families, but often then become quite isolated. The family might then move to Australia. And they were left. And this group, when we initially met with them, we were talking about how isolated they were, that they were getting, um, there was quite a lot of, uh, well, frankly, violence and abuse from them towards, uh, towards them from other uh, parts of the community. And over the period of the study, they created a friendship group. They incorporated themselves as a society so they could then apply for funding. They had a um, group that then met regularly and they had resources to meet. They would hit um, mahjong and thing resources. But they also then created a friendship group with the local modai of older Māori. They got involved in a community garden. They started exchanging cooking lessons and different styles and language lessons. And it was a great example of nurturing of community and connectedness. But having the opportunity to apply for some funding to create that initially was really important. So that's what I say, programs that allow people to do that. There was their solution. They came up with that. Um, but giving them resources that do that, I think those are little scale, tiny things. It's, it's not a lot of resources that was needed, but it had a huge impact. So things like that, that people can do. And in the um, later study, people talk about wishing they could have that, that, that access to that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Anne. Hello. I just wanted to say, um, first of all, thank you so much, Janine, for a very inspiring and comprehensive um, presentation on resilience. And for those who don't know me, I'm the um, scientific coordinator of the Brenda Strafford Center on Aging. And I just want to put out another invitation. It's a wonderful opportunity to ask Janine questions about her the research that she's presented, both her own and others. But I also thought I would start with a question of my own, um, which is um, you spoke about different domains of resilience, and I know that uh, Dr. Hogan had, had um, talked about that. And you also spoke about the um, propensity that we have to look at independence and dependence as polar opposites. And I see some real parallels between thinking about different domains of resilience and then this kind of spectrum approach to having interdependency um, and interdependencies. And I just wondered if you have anything that you might elaborate on a little bit in terms of the way those things might fit together or what you heard from some of the older adults who you um, had the privilege of speaking with as a researcher. 
Um, yeah, I think a lot of the reciprocity that they talked about, so the, con the contributions, and we wrote about that in the paper, where um, it was the relationships between groups. So in one community, the, the example that springs to mind, I guess, is um, a community of Pacific older people who have quite significant language barriers and things in, ter in terms of interacting with the local community. So they were migrants that had been brought over. The history of New Zealand is that we had labour shortages in the 1950s and we brought in lots of people from the Pacific as, um, who were lowest trade labour kind of came in. And then as the labour shortage went down, there was some quite people, they tried to move them off and it was some pretty awful history that we have there. But this particular group were brought, came across to work in the mill and have worked in a pulp and paper mill for a long time um, in a really tight-knit community, really, between themselves. But they talked a lot about their interactions with neighbours and the interdependence between them, so the interactions they had with their non-Pacific neighbours who were New Zealand European or other groups um, and how important that was that they connected with each other. Yeah. But it's at a kind of collective level but there's also, at an individual level, um, people who might be, a lot of the people we've spoken with and actually right through those studies, who ostensibly are a care recipient, someone who's living with family that's looking, looking after them, but actually providing heaps of care back. There's lots of things going both ways, so care for grandchildren, advice, emotional support, all of those things, that interdependence. And so it might look like dependent relationship, but it's actually heaps of interdependence. And I think that's really important. It's, it's, we're all interdependent all the time. It's just that for some of us, it's easier to make that less visible. And, and, and the issue about some of the adaptation is ups and downs is when, when it becomes visible that, you're, that we're the, the relationships between people. And that's hard for people to negotiate and accept. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Um, I'd also like to echo the thanks for a wonderful and informative talk. Um, one of the things you mentioned was um, the improvements that can be done to a community to make, uh, for example, dementia candidates feel safer, um, things are more familiar, et cetera, et cetera. It strikes me that any improvement you make along those lines would improve life for so many demographics. Yeah. Yeah. And do you see much collaboration between you know, these various groups, not just aging uh, advocates, but also, um, you know, wheelchair-bound yeah. folks yeah. who have real jobs and live in the world, but they're yeah. very limited in how to get around or where they might find an accessible washroom, things like that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, because it seems to me the collaboration would, you know, yeah. really increase the urgency, the, the, the funding, sourcing, and everything. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. Um, and, and all those age-friendly th aspects of an age-friendly city are great for every other group. They're great for people with disabilities moving around, um, for people with young children moving around, for example, too. Uh, all very helpful. Um, that's the study that we're just starting on now, actually, on inclusive streets. And so that started, we were looking at these, um, there's a huge movement in New Zealand, probably in Calgary, too, to get people cycling and active movement and active travel. But the concern was that a lot of that is completely ignores people who are not kind of the, the norm. And how does that look? And so we want to do exactly what you're talking about, bring together older people and people living with disability to, to engage with those kind of things. And already we have, we've had a really interesting research um, workshop a bit like this, actually, where we t talked about, and one of the things that they talked about was this kind of policy that um, any new building or something that happens should should be accessible, but there's no teeth to that at all. So um, that's the first thing to go. It might be there in the design, but the project manager, as things happen on the build, it goes. And so in Auckland at the moment, we're doing a massive uh, rebuild of our public transport. They're trying to make a ring system, and it will be five years of huge disruption to the city. Nobody, you never know where it's going to be. It's really hard to move around. And so we talked about that. that you want to create an accessible environment, but the process of getting there, the build itself, is really inaccessible too. So in that conversation, we had public um, transport planners in the room too, and that's part of our study, is that we'll have them in the room. So first we'll talk with the people, um, our participants, 
but that part of the study is then to bring transport planners into the room and have the conversation with them. We're really excited about that. And so some of the research team are plan transport planners, and some of us live with disabilities and some of us are older, um, and get those conversations going. Yeah, we hope that, that it will, we're quite excited about this project as a way to do that. But I completely agree with you, the kind of sense of collaboration, potential for collaboration is huge, yeah. yeah. Okay, we have a question over here. Thank you so much. Um, I've followed your work for many years, so it's really a pleasure to uh, hear you live. Thank you. Uh, you covered a lot of ground, and what stood out for me, or what kind of surprised me, um, coming from a research perspective of uh, studying uh, or working with older adults experiencing homelessness and low-income seniors, um, was when you said that um, what an important component was the desire to have meaningful or close ties with family yeah. and friends and neighbors. Yeah. And from my own experience in research, um, especially in congregate living situations, uh, the older adults tend to want to kind of keep their distance and actually appreciate the functional kind of yeah. or instrumental relationships between neighbors more so than having people in their living rooms and I'm just curious um, in all of your all of the the beautiful studies you presented if if that was something um, if you if you had any experience working with more marginalized older adults or you know more invisible homeless and if you can kind of if you can speak to that yeah I think what you've just said is really interesting isn't it um, the way that family relationships work, yeah, and the sense of privacy. Mm. I've actually got a really interesting PhD student I'm working with at the moment who's, um, she's doing a study, it, it's an intervention, so a housing trust has created a house for, there's, there's two houses they've created, each for five women who've, who've um, who marginal, vulnerably housed, I think we could say. And they've been living together now for, it's been three or four years that that's been happening. And she's looking at what's the lived experience of that, what does it look like? And yeah, some of what you were saying is really interesting, the difficulty of those kind of relationships, that, how intense they are and can be quite intrusive. And so, so f they're not for everybody. Some people want it to be really close. So they, these houses have, each person has a room and a bathroom, but they have a shared kitchen and laundry space and some of the negotiations around those and, and actually more even more so the shared living space and how you manage that the living room exactly what you just said yeah how tricky that is yeah i'd like to talk more yeah that's really interesting kind of findings because it doesn't work the same for everybody does it yeah in new zealand we think about um the maori concept of whanau which is family but it's extended family so it's not kind of a straightforward nuclear family and whanau can be kind of who you make it Right, so um, your your family, not family, but Fano is might not be what a typical thing looks like too. So I wonder if that might be something to think about too, because I know some of the work Shiloh Groot, for example, have you heard, seen her work on on vulnerably housed and homelessness has talked about some of that too. Yeah, yeah, and really interesting ideas. Yeah, thank you. Good. No, I, I'm just going to tell you one more bit of information before we break tonight. Uh, New Zealanders are the fastest English speakers in the world. They, they say more words per minute than other English speakers. Uh, uh, Janine told me this earlier and I asked her to please slow down you know, and, and move at a Canadian pace and you did a wonderful job. I tried really hard. <laughs> So I, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Janine for her wonderful presentation, great overview, um, and resiliency is living with issues, and also we have to look at the environment as well as the individual. So when we think of resiliency, don't think of the 80-year-old weightlifter, you know, a bodybuilder, which we've all seen those pictures. It's really living with issues and thriving with the challenges we all face and thinking about our community and looking at different levels. And thank you very much, and it was a great start for our day and a half. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.